Lorraine and Ed Warren are known for their relentless courage and unquestionable talent when it comes to dealing with the dark, the unknown, and the unholy. Among the many words that describe the Warrens, fear is not one of them, at least not until 1976 when they faced what for Lorraine was, and still is, the scariest moment of her life. The horrors that happened in this suburban house in Amityville. When the Lutz family fled their home after only 28 days of being there, claiming that it was haunted. We see a flashback to when it happened. It's foggy outside as Lorraine, Ed, and a group of people get ready to start a seance. Warren's brave assistant Drew sets up all his gear around the house to capture any and every movement and the manifestation of the unholy. Lorraine gives the scared family living in the house instructions to keep them safe. Their goal is to find out if what's tormenting the Lutz family is a crime driven by anger and hate, or the manifestation of the demonic. Everyone is silent and focused. Lorraine has always been the most sensitive one, the one that feels, sees, and hears what Ed simply can't. It takes Lorraine just a few seconds to tune in her mind and spirit with the house, and the tragedy of the DeFeo family that was brutally erased from the face of the earth. Her spirit wanders around the rooms, grabbing all the feelings and energies the place has. Quickly, Lorraine feels a spine-chilling vibe. She goes upstairs to the bedroom, where a couple sleeps. As she approaches, the door opens, revealing a bloody scenery on the bed. Lorraine realizes she's reliving the tragic events that led to the demise of the DeFeo family. The visions are so vivid, she can even feel the cold gun in her hands. She moves to the kids' room, where two boys sleep. They are put down as well. So, she moves to the next bedroom, where a teenage girl is asleep. She has the same awful fate as the rest of the family. Lorraine is tense, lost, and she doesn't know where to go until the spectrum of a boy with glowy eyes gets her attention, leading her down into a cellar. There, she meets the spirits of four kids trying to show her something. Something awful, something deeply unholy. She looks around and, before noticing, the kids are gone. She's left with no clues, except for an object covered in a white sheet standing behind her. She takes the sheet off and reveals an old mirror. There's nothing there but her reflection. She looks back and sees nothing. She looks to the mirror, and the image of a hateful nun stands right behind her. She looks back again. Nothing. When she turns to the mirror one last time, the demonic nun grabs her by the neck, squeezing a terrifying scream out of Lorraine. Immediately, her spirit travels back to her shaking body. Ed checks on his wife, trying to understand what she saw that led her to that shock. Lorraine holds on to Ed, confessing that whatever they do next, she can never get as close to hell as she just got. Ed has never seen so much fear and despair on his wife's face. But as fate would have it, they are asked to check on a family in Enfield, England, that has been experiencing disturbing events. Ed and Lorraine Warren have never considered knowing their limits, not before Amityville. Now, they will have to decide if they're willing to cross those limits again to help the fragile Hodgson family in England. Far from Amityville, little Janet Hodgson sneaks out with her friend to gossip a little. Janet looks and sounds like a naive girl, who's afraid of her mom catching her ditching class can talk about boys with her friend. Her friend, on the other hand, couldn't be happier with the idea of kissing the boy she likes. That seems like too much information to Janet. Her friend hands her a so she can get something in her bag. She returns to Janet a Ouija board they made together but, before little Janet has the chance to give her back her cigarette, the school's principal catches them red-handed. The girls run like cockroaches when the lights are on. The Hodgson kids, Margaret, Janet, Johnny, and Billy, are picked on on their way out of school, but they can defend themselves pretty well. As they get home, Peggy Hodgson is already aware of Janet's recent hiccup. The single mother of four is in a tight spot, having to provide for her kids and make ends meet. Janet keeps saying she hasn't done anything wrong, but Peggy has had enough, and she snaps at the kids. It's bedtime now. Johnny plays with his crooked man toy in his room, Billy is in his tent playing firefighter, and the girls are in their room. Margaret finds Janet playing with a ragged Ouija board made out of a cereal box. That doesn't hold them back, and they play anyway. Janet asks whoever is out there if her dad will come home. There's no answer. Later that night, Janet feels uncomfortable, wakes up, and the strangest thing happens. She's not in her bed, she's lying on the floor in the living room. In the dark, upstairs, in bed, Margaret is the one who wakes up. She hears knocks on the door, strong ones. She realizes Janet isn't in her bed, so she opens the door, but there's no one there. Janet comes out of the shadows seconds later, saying she wasn't the one who knocked. When morning comes and the kids are at school, Peggy has a friend over at the house to vent her problem. They talk about Janet's behavior and do the laundry, but a water pipe bursts all of a sudden. On the other side of the Atlantic, Ed and Lorraine attend a debate on national television. The TV host is the bridge between the Warrens and the skeptical Dr. Kaplan, who's relentless in stating that everything the Warrens do is nothing but a bunch of hoaxes. Needless to say, the debate is a disaster. In Enfield, Janet helps her little brother with his stutter. They sing along to the melody of the Crooked Man music toy. The boy does well and gets a cookie in return. Everyone goes to bed, but Billy keeps eating the cookies against his mom's orders, and it doesn't take long until he goes downstairs looking for water. The house is dark, with no lights on at this hour. The little boy gets to the sink and, through the window, he sees one of the swings going back and forth with the wind. Just one, not both swings, which is odd. Janet's having a nightmare, 
and it looks like a sad one. Margaret wakes up, trying to put her sister at ease. Janet talks in her sleep, asking something or someone to leave her house. Margaret calms her down but, as she turns her back to sleep, Janet is sitting on the bed having a dialogue with herself. She talks to someone who wants her family out of there. The voice tells her it's been playing with Billy. Margaret manages to put her back in bed, but she's the one who hears a voice now. The deep raspy voice tells her that's its house. Everything fades away when she turns on the bedside lamp. Janet goes back to bed in a complete trance. Billy goes back to his room and stumbles on his firefighter truck. He tosses it in the tent and goes to bed, but the truck comes back to his room, sounding the alarm. When the truck comes back to him, he hears a roar that contaminates the air around him. He doesn't think twice and sprints to his mom's bedroom, screaming. Peggy is up, and goes to the tent to show Billy there's nothing there. But they hear a noise, a bang on the wall, maybe. Peggy tells her boy to go to his room quickly, and heads downstairs to the living room. Turns out that Janet is on the bouncy armchair in a trance, again. She takes the girl, who's burning up with a fever, back to bed. Janet is at home the next morning, since the fever didn't let her go to school, but it's not only her who's sick, the house looks sick, too. The peeling walls and stained tiles. The poor state of the furnishing, everything in the house screams old and sick. Her siblings and mom are out and, like most children in the 70s who couldn't go to school, she starts a fight with the TV, which goes bananas, changing channels when it feels like it. Janet takes a quick break from the TV to answer her mom's phone call. Janet assures her mom that everything is fine. What neither Peggy nor Janet knows is that things will take a twist they couldn't imagine. The girl freezes when she sees something on the bouncy armchair, something she didn't put there. The TV remote sits on the worn-out armchair, which makes Janet paralyzed for a while. There's nothing there except for the remote. She picks it up quickly, as if something would grab her hand if she doesn't. The battle to choose something interesting to watch continues, but it seems like the TV is messing with her. It keeps changing channels all the time, and now, it stops working altogether. She slaps the wooden box, but the channels don't come back, as it turns itself off. The dark screen reflects what's in front of it, and Janet sees an old and frail man sitting on the bouncy armchair. She jumps back and, when she looks at it, the man is gone and the remote falls to the floor. Janet is breathless and petrified, but the most frightening thing happens to her seconds after the remote hits the floor. The old man with yellow eyes is behind the little girl, and screams that she's in his house. Inevitably, Janet cracks down crying, and screams, completely home alone, or almost. Back in the US, Lorraine wakes up to an empty bed, which she finds odd. She finds Ed downstairs in his study, painting. He couldn't sleep very well, he had some strange dreams and decided to paint it. Lorraine has a bad feeling and a bitter taste in her mouth when she sees her husband's painting. It's a demonic figure disguised as a nun. She takes a sit at the dining table to drink her morning tea. Ed sees how distressed she is. Lorraine wants to stop working on cases. She's quite drained and edgy. Ed understands, and decides to take a leap of faith by indulging his wife's wishes. It's bedtime for the Hodgsons but, this time, Janet tries something extreme. Margaret turns up her radio to help her sleep and sees Janet tying herself to the bed. The tired girl is doing what she can to not walk around the house in her sleep. It doesn't work. Something throws her out of bed, making a loud noise. But Margaret doesn't hear it and sleeps profoundly. She picks up a flashlight and leaves the bedroom, calling for her mom, who doesn't answer. The house is darker than ever as she walks downstairs to check on the living room. The bouncy armchair swings out of the blue, bringing Janet to a state of dread she has never experienced before. She sprints upstairs, back to her room, and throws herself under the sheets, holding the flashlight on. The poor thing cries as she struggles to stay still. She feels something behind her and, when she takes the sheet off of her head, can't hold her fear back and screams at the top of her lungs. A chair is tossed right beside her bed. She screams and wakes up Margaret, who tries to calm her down, and Janet finally spills the beans and tells her big sister there's someone in the room with them. Before Margaret has any chance to talk her out of the idea, their beds begin to shake violently. Peggy rushes out of bed, but before she gets to their bedroom, the scared girls are shaking at her door. They are desperate, saying that there's someone in their bedroom and that the bed was shaking like crazy, and Janet reveals that something bit her shoulder, leaving a disgusting round deep red bite mark on it. Peggy checks the room that seems alright, except for the Ouija board under Janet's bed. Once again, Peggy vomits her frustrations all over her kids for the constant lying and misbehavior, but the girls and the mom are caught by surprise when the dresser flies off across the room. Peggy Hodgson takes her children across the street to her friend's house. Her friends, the Nottinghams, help them calm down. Vic checks on the house but finds nothing, so he calls the police. The police officers research for whatever is disturbing the Hodgson's, but find nothing either. Until they hear noises, bangs coming from the wall. Peggy, Vic, and the officers conclude that there's nothing they can do when a misplaced chair surfs its way back to the kitchen table. On their way out, one of the officers offers Peggy some help, suggesting she talks to a priest who's a friend of her family, because there isn't much she or her partner can do to help. In a very different scenario, Lorraine and Judy spend time together in the library, listening to the radio and occupying their minds with some reading. Lorraine doesn't know now, but Judy has felt a presence passing behind them. Little do they know that the answer to the nasty and hateful events that are about to unfold is right there, in plain sight, on the bookcase. Lorraine looks, and Judy isn't there. The girl is in the hall, petrified. 
She can't say for sure, so she points and asks her mom what she sees. The tall and slim pale figure stares at both mother and daughter and moves away. It's that thing Ed was painting the other day. That grabbed Lorraine's spirit by the neck during the seance. Judy goes back to the library, and Lorraine follows the evil thing to Ed's office. That's where the painting is, hanging on the wall of the half-lit room. She turns the floor lamp on, and the radio turns on immediately. Lorraine knows no good can come from that. Before she gets to the door, the malignant entity shuts it abruptly, and its shadow walks toward the painting. The shadow has found a way to personify in front of Lorraine, and tosses her to the wall. Lorraine Warren doesn't hold back, and confronts the demonic nun, asking what it is. Judy shakes her mom, trying to wake her up. Lorraine screams and scratches all over, but eventually comes out of her vision. Another drizzling morning in Enfield, and Peggy speeds up to get home before getting soaking wet. She's approached by a man who claims to be a news reporter. He convinces her to give an interview about the creepy events she and her children have been experiencing. That may be their only shot at finding some help. The story draws the attention of the specialist consultant, Morris Gross, who assists the family during the interview when something sinister happened. The news reporter interviews Janet and Margaret in the living room. A small group stands around the reporter, waiting to hear what the girls have to say. Among the ones terrified, or in complete awe of the events, is the skeptic Anita Gregory, who's also investigating the strange happening. Janet starts to feel strange and moves funny. The reporter takes the opportunity to ask who it is. The little girl is now pale, and has a hateful laugh. It's no longer Janet who's speaking, his name is Bill. He says he was a 72-year-old man, who passed away sitting on the bouncy armchair, and claims that they're all invaders in his home. The reporter's camera films every second of the startling conversation. Peggy takes the children to the Nottingham's home to spend the night. Across the street, in the Hodgson's home, the crooked man toy lights up and plays the song, which sounds threatening now. In the Nottingham's house, everyone's asleep, but Billy hears the dog's bell and decides to follow it. The sweet dog turns into the one and only crooked man, that terrorizes Billy to the point of running away screaming. The crooked man sings its song, while Peggy desperately tries to hold her children. Vic and his wife are also up, and sprint to the living room. The crooked man's voice is coming from the tormented Janet. She's not herself anymore, and the vile and powerful entity that has taken over her body tosses the fireplace screen viciously, crashing the curio dresser across the room. Peggy holds her unconscious daughter, completely hopeless. Finally, Ed and Lorraine hear about the Hodgson story. Father Gordon shows them the tape of Janet's painful interview and asks the couple of demonologists to take a trip to Enfield and check if it's true or just a mediatic hoax, before the church makes its move to help them. Lorraine is reluctant, and later that day, explains to Ed why. She shares with him what she's been dealing with all this time. When they helped Morris and the Lutz family in Amityville, she had a horrible premonition in which the inhuman spirit disguised as a nun takes her loving husband from her, forever. They arrive in London, and are welcomed by Morris Gross, who takes them to the Hodgson's residence. They'll stay there to investigate the case. For Ed and Lorraine, the best way to deal with their cases is by staying in the eye of the tornado, where everything happens. Peggy takes Ed and Lorraine straight to Janet's bedroom, where most of the demonic manifestation happened. The door is locked and, inside, the air isn't pure or light. Ed is astonished by what he sees in the girl's bedroom. Peggy shielded the wall with crosses given to her by friends and neighbors. They all hoped that the crosses would somehow seal up the room, preventing evil from manifesting again. But she tells them that it didn't work. Ed takes a tour around the house to see how it has been affected by all the terrible events, while Lorraine checks on Janet to get to know the girl. Lorraine has such a powerful light that everyone feels at ease near her. Janet is an 11-year-old girl who's physically, emotionally, and spiritually exhausted. Such a tiny human can barely handle the sleepless nights, friends avoiding her, the media circus exploiting her image and her family's, too, and the despair on her mother's face for being powerless. Janet is a wreck. Peggy shows at the living room, where Janet would appear suddenly in the middle of the night. Morris explains that the bouncy armchair seems to be the center of the drama. That's where Janet saw the old Bill sitting, holding the TV remote. Peggy's husband bought the house, and the entire furniture with it. Sometime later, he left his family for another woman. He left not only his children and wife, but also every ounce of positive energy, not to mention he took her Elvis Presley vinyl collection, which makes Peggy even more furious. That's the perfect scenario for any evil entity to thrive. It feeds from the fragile moment of the family, spiritually and emotionally speaking. Janet finally has a chance to vent about the hell she's been living. And she gets to do that with someone who truly understands her, with Lorraine. She shares all the scary feelings and experiences, like when the voice talks to her and through her and all the hateful things it says. Lorraine wants to know what the voice tells her. Janet goes as pale as the London sky right now. The girl shares that the voice, the entity, is near her as they speak and that it wants to hurt Lorraine. The foggy and pale landscape gives way to pouring rain, bringing the Warrens and the Hodgsons inside the haunted house. Ed and Lorraine prepare Peggy and the girls for what's to come. They must remember. They are there only to investigate and collect evidence that what's happening to the Hodgsons is true so that the church can step in. Janet sits on the nasty armchair, with a glass of water next to her. Ed is ready to evoke the malignant entity and film whatever happens. Tension is peaking right now. To prove that Bill speaks through Janet, the girl takes a sip of water and holds it in her mouth, that's how they'll prove she's not lying. 
the corner where the armchair is gets darker, and the air around it, cold and sour. Janet's voice disappears, and the raspy and low voice leads the conversation. Bill teases Ed, to make him angry, but Ed knows better and questions Bill's presence and influence on Janet. When Ed shows it a crucifix, the raspy voice gives way to a painful groaning. When the dark cloud fades away, Janet seems weaker than ever and shocks everyone in the room as she spits out the water in her mouth. Bedtime for Lorraine and Ed. They take Johnny and Billy's room. Janet stays with her mom and Peggy's room. Outside, the wind and the squeaky swings bring some bad omens, and Janet hears a whistle. When she comes out from a sleepy state, she sees herself stuck to the living room ceiling and old Bill whistling a song. She can't move, and he goes upstairs. Whatever forces old Bill controls, it takes Janet from the living room ceiling directly to her locked bedroom. The crucifixes on the wall turn upside down, and the disgusting spectrum of old Bill attacks the defenseless girl. Peggy, Lorraine, and Ed rush to the doomed bedroom door, but it's chained to the radiator. They can't get inside. The situation is unbearable for Janet, who's now wrapped around the bedroom curtains. She can't breathe. Ed keeps trying to break in, but he just can't. Peggy finally finds the key to the door, and unlocks it just in time to save Janet from suffocating. Everything goes silent, but Lorraine can still feel the dark energy the unholy entity left in the room, as she notices one of the crucifixes moving back to its position. Lorraine, Ed, Anita, Morris, and his assistant debate the evidence they have so far and how strong the case is. They conclude that they need concrete proof of Janet's miserable situation. Morris and his assistant are responsible for getting better equipment to film the events, while Ed and Lorraine go back to the Hodgsons to try to mend the family's spirit a little bit. That's the first time all four kids get together after Ed and Lorraine arrived in London. They come back to the house bringing some gifts. Among those gifts are some Elvis Presley vinyl, and Warren's traditional advice, to defeat a bully, the family must stick together and that awful entity works as Janet's bully. The kids can't hold back their happiness and sense of courage at that moment. The record player is broken, completely useless, but Ed is determined to lighten the mood in the house. He spots a guitar hidden between the fireplace and the curio dresser. Bingo! The music problem is solved. That's Margaret's guitar, but she doesn't mind lending it to Ed. The mood shifts in a blink of an eye when Ed plays. Can't Help But Fall In Love by Elvis Presley. The kids gather around him, sitting on the floor and watching him. They're dazzled by that small but meaningful moment in their home. They laugh and sing along with sparkling eyes. Lorraine is emotional and fearful for her husband. She feels her premonition getting closer. The night is coming, and they must get the equipment and ghost traps ready for the darkest hour. Janet and Ed work in the kitchen, while Ed shares some childhood memories, one in particular. He was once scared of the unknown darkness. But one of the nuns in the Catholic school taught him that whenever he felt that way, he just needed to hold onto his crucifix and be mindful that God would always protect him. He shows Janet the crucifix he has carried for decades around his neck. It seems like Ed is needed downstairs in the basement, where the water pipes broke. The place is freezing, dark, and flooded. He's got a lot on his plate right now. Morris and Lorraine talk about the afterlife on the sidewalk, while Peggy stays with Ed in the basement. He finds the leak and works on it, and Peggy shines the flashlight on him to help a little. Ed's got water on up to his thigh and Peggy can barely help. She sees something lurking behind Ed. What she can't see yet is that it's old Bill, getting closer and closer to Ed Warren, but the entity plays its tricks as usual. His pale figure is now close to Peggy, and inevitably grabs her by the arm. She struggles to get rid of it, and so does Ed. Peggy is freaking out, because her arm has been bitten, just like Janet's shoulder. Something falls into the water, it's old Bill's dentures, that match perfectly with the bite mark on Peggy's arm. Upstairs, the kids are in a Christmas mood. They get the Christmas tree lit up while listening to Christmas carols. But the happy times end when Janet sees old Bill playing with knives in the dark kitchen. The kids remember what Ed told them about bullies. That the family has to stick together to protect themselves, so Johnny goes right into the kitchen to face Janet's bully. The nightmare begins. Janet vanishes before Margaret's eyes, and appears in the kitchen holding a knife, ready to jump onto Johnny. The commotion escalates, so Peggy and Ed sprint upstairs. Chairs fly over them, and doors shut right on their noses. Anita smokes in the backyard, while Lorraine, Morris, and his assistant rush back inside. Margaret screams. Johnny and Janet are isolated in the kitchen, and the grown-ups fight tooth and nail to reach them. Ed goes beyond his limits to break the kitchen door. When they're finally there, Johnny and Janet are simply gone. The cutlery is completely twisted, and the room is shattered. Peggy finds Johnny hiding in the pantry, but Janet is missing. Morris's assistant follows the trail of destruction with his gear on, to capture signs of any paranormal activity. He hears loud threatening bangs and groanings in the walls and the crawling spaces. They find Janet twisted inside the tiny power box. Old Billy's still there, but Ed reaches out to her and gets Janet out. The recordings show Janet staging the events in the kitchen. Ed, Lorraine, and the others may believe them, but can't do anything without proof. They all leave the Hodgson's house. Margaret and Billy question Janet's actions in the kitchen. The frightened girl confesses that Old Bill promised that, if she didn't fake it, he would destroy her family. On the train, Ed and Lorraine still rack their brains, trying to explain what the tapes showed. Things are so hectic that the recording tapes fall on the train floor, and that rings a bell in Ed's mind. They set up the record player to hear their findings one more time. That's their last chance to save the Hodgson family, and they are running against the clock. 
The tapes captured nonsensical things old Bill said through Janet, and that's Ed's cue. He plays two tapes at the same time, and they find out that the recordings complete each other, revealing a message, Janet's cry for help, because old Bill won't let go of her. A violent vision of old Bill washes over Lorraine. They're both in some dark version of the living room, and Bill confesses that he wants to leave Janet and rest, but something doesn't let him, and this thing, this entity, wants Janet. Lorraine tries to understand him, but now, he talks in riddles. She asks how she can stop it, but his reply is just about something that is given and taken, that follows you from your first breath. You didn't ask for it, but it'll stay with you until your last breath. When she reaches for him, trying to understand what he says, she is cast out of the trance by the appearance of the vile and human spirit that's been following her, the one that had painted. Her mind is back with her on the train, and they're both in panic. It turns out that old Bill's spirit is just a pawn in the inhuman and hateful spirits game. It wants to get Janet. They need to run back to her house. Peggy picks up the pieces of her kitchen in complete devastation, but the nightmare doesn't stop there. A living room window breaks, and all four kids levitate, while Janet is completely out of herself. Vic drives Ed and Lorraine back, while they work on old Bill's riddle. Ed cracks it, it's the name. Once they learn the demon's name, they'll have enough power to cast it out, but Ed thinks they don't know its name. Lorraine can't say for sure, but she knows better. They're back, and struggle to get inside the house. Ed is tossed away from the window as he tries to break in. He goes around to the basement door. Alone, Lorraine can't reach him. Ed decides to go to Janet alone, and that gets Lorraine out of her mind because of her premonition. He goes upstairs anyway. Ed is attacked and can't see or hear well. Everything is blurry. The house is a complete disaster by now, but he keeps following his instincts and decides to perform an exorcism on the house. Lorraine is outside in the rain, trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. She hangs by a thread and pulls a memory out from the back of her mind. The moment when she and Judy saw the demonic nun at home. She confronted it, asking its name, but she couldn't find it out back then. Now, it comes back to her that she wrote it when it destroyed her Bible. She checks the ripped pages, and they form the name, Valak. She conjures it, and a flash of lightning splits the tree in front of the Hodgson house. Inside, Ed is tormented by the crooked man, and everything gets worse when he gets near to Janet. She's in her bedroom window, ready to jump. Ed holds onto the curtains and throws himself out, holding Janet. When Lorraine gets there, she's tossed to the wall by Valak, but now she knows its name and Lorraine Warren casts Valak out for good, just in time to save Ed and Janet from falling. Morning comes, and the family is shaken but alive. They give Ed and Lorraine their heartfelt thanks, and Ed gifts Janet with his crucifix. Janet and her family went through hell but, at the same time, they consider themselves fortunate for having two courageous people beside them, who believe in them, and who are there to fight for their souls. As it happens, after each difficult case, Ed takes the object that serves as a conduit for the demon to manifest to the room downstairs, where every unholy thing rests locked. Upstairs, Lorraine plays can't help fall in love on the record player and invites her beloved husband to dance. After the hardships and challenges they faced, Ed and Lorraine come back stronger than ever, and so do their love and commitment to each other.